Over the next few minutes together, we're gonna to explore how organizations can embrace and benefit from talents of people living with disabilities. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our next speaker to you. Liz Johnson is Paralympic gold medalist, founder and managing director of the Ability People. In the name of all the competitors, I promise that we shall take part in these Paralympic Games in the true spirit of sportsmanship, the glory of sport, and the honor of our teams. I think the Paralympics and the Paralympic movement are the perfect vehicle to initiate and prompt change. For me, it was a real honor to get to compete at a home Paralympic Games. And I was like, this is never gonna happen again. So just enjoy every single second of it. For two weeks, you was nothing else but people with disabilities on TV, doing sport, getting gold medals, just like the Olympians were. So all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh wow, you know, people can. Since retiring, I've realised that actually there's a lot of limitations and barriers that aren't placed on you by yourself, but are actually placed on you by society. A lot of the time, disabled people will be sat at home looking at roles and not knowing if they can apply for them. Recently, I set up a company that is run entirely by people with impairments so that they can work remotely and with flexible hours as consultants or resources from anywhere in the world. Earlier on this year she got in touch with me and said would you like to be involved and I jumped at the chance because one it's employment but it's not just employment it's employment with somebody who understands the nature of disability firsthand. Hi John. Yeah. When I'm telling yeah, Liz oh this might be a little bit difficult. I don't have to explain myself. She knows why already. I know that my team are strong and I know that they want to succeed and they will succeed. And so hopefully when they do, the model itself will filter down to other organisations. As somebody with a disability, when you're employed, people expect much more of you. We are all human beings, so you know we can all meet the same benchmarks. It's just we do it in different ways. People with disabilities, they're some of the most resourceful, resilient, dedicated and motivated people on the planet. People need to stop hiding at home behind closed doors and get out there because the world has changed. Employ persons with disabilities now. It's good for you, it's good for them, it's good for us all. Thank you very much, thank you. You can relax, that's the only video I'm gonna show you. So, um, I guess the good place to start is the reason that that video was made and the ability people were lucky enough to be a part of it was because we teamed up with the United Nations to work on their sustainable development goals surrounding employment and why employment should be for all. So it made sense that we also partnered with the International Paralympic Committee to put that together because their main focus was trying to promote why when you host a Paralympics or an Olympic Games, the benefit and the legacy it has to the wider society and the wider environment when once the sport leaves the city. So the, this picture you can see now is the opening ceremony from London 2012. And somewhere in that stage in the middle, I stood on it, as you saw in the video, and it was down to me to say the athlete oath uh, on behalf of all of the athletes that were taking part in that Games. And the thing that's important about the athlete oath is this, it's the same for the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. And it's the same to the point where I don't even get the, the glory of having that as my, as my thing in my house. Because my partner, he swims as well, but he swims for Brazil. And we all know where the next games were in Rio. And just because he couldn't handle the fact that I had done something that he hadn't, he then somehow managed to manipulate the situation so that he got to read the oath. <laughs> but he did, because he'd practiced it with me, he didn't even need to practice it because he knew it word for word because it is exactly the same every summer games, every winter games, as I said, every Olympics, every Paralympics. But it's not just the athletes that say the oath, 
the officials and the judges say the oath, and then the coaches say an oath as well. And in that oath, you promise that you are going to compete or participate in whatever form you are participating with fairness and integrity. And that reason, and sometimes the focus is on the athlete. The athlete at the games generally gets the most glory, especially if they're lucky enough to get a medal. But ultimately, often the judges and the coaches and the officials get overlooked. But their oath is equally important, and actually some would say more so, because they make a promise that they are not going to be biased in any way. And they are going to be completely impartial, which then enables every single athlete at that Games to have the same opportunity in the field of play to win a medal. Obviously, the people come from different places, people have better access to training, but ultimately, when you get to a, a, a competition as big as the Olympics or the Paralympics, you are the top 1% in the world, in your sport. So you've all got a pretty good chance of winning. So if it, would, it wouldn't be fair if the judges then applied any form of bias and gave someone an opportunity or let someone have a head start. And so we know that prejudice is not OK in sport, and we won't tolerate it. And we know that everybody needs to be treated fairly. And we know it's not fair if people aren't fair, uh, aren't, aren't um, what's the word I'm looking for? If they are not, if they don't treat you fairly and they aren't impartial, then ultimately that talent gets stifled. And it, we all know that that doesn't make sense. So if you were to turn on the TV and watch the Olympics or the Paralympics and people were getting head starts or getting heavier shot put, uh, yeah, heavier shot put or any form of advantage, we'd all be complaining. So why is it that we don't do that in every other area of the world, um, of world as well? So whether that be in life or in work, ultimately, I guess, when we say it's lessons that sport and Paralympics can bring to the, to the real world, for want of a better phrase, we don't actually mean lessons. We mean experiences and insights that we have learned along the way because there was a time where the Paralympics wasn't treated the same as the Olympics. And basically, when I first wanted to be a swimmer, back in 1996, when the games were here in America, in Atlanta, it was the first time they'd ever been televised. So it was the first time little old me had had the opportunity to even realize they existed. And I was a super sports fan. I could tell you where I was when I first watched the Olympics, but I didn't even know the Paralympics existed. And so why should I not get the, we, we know it now to be true, that it, is, it takes more than being a little girl with, who's disabled, who likes swimming, to go to the Paralympics, because ultimately, Back then, that was kind of what happened. If you could do sport and you were disabled, then there was a good chance you would make your, your national team and you'd get to go to the Paralympic Games. Whereas now it's a lot more elite. As I said, the top 1% of athletes get to go, and that's how it should be. So why is it that we don't treat everything like that? Why is it that we're like, oh, yeah, we'll give that person a chance? And you, when we say give them a chance, we want to give them a fair chance. We don't want to give them a chance through the back door or with a, with a leg up or with a head start because that, de that devalues their value. That makes other people not take them seriously. So the lesson, when we say a lesson, as I said, like I said, it's insights. 1996 to the modern day, that's a long time. Like It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. And so if it can happen in one sector, why can't it happen in every sector? So that kind of takes me to me. So, ah. <laughs> Three pictures of me, that they're, they're monumental times in my life, but they not, not, none of them have defined me single-handedly, but they all are very relevant. And so we'll take the first picture to start with. And in that picture, what can you see? A child who hasn't learned to smile yet. Fine, okay, granted. But other than that, that's like my second week of preschool or kindergarten here. But like, so, so my second week of school. And all that you can see in that picture, correct me if I'm wrong, is a little three-year-old with bunches. Like, there's no way in that picture to tell that I am different to any of my peers. And as you can see, I definitely am. And I really wish I could put this clicker down because I need this hand to do quotation marks and things. But anyway, I can't, so we'll just have to ride with it. But ultimately, 
in that picture, there is no way of telling that there's anything different about me to anybody else, which in some situations is brilliant because we all know that people make judgments on what they see in front of them. But in other situations, it'd be really helpful to say, no, I'm not drunk all the time, and I'm not really bad at these things. I just haven't got any coordination, and my right side is a whole lot weaker than my left. Because I was born with a, a disability called cerebral palsy. So you can call it a condition, you can call it an impairment, you can call it whatever you want. But the important thing to remember is that I don't suffer from it. It's just a part of who I am. Just like some people have red hair, some people have glasses, I have cerebral palsy. And so when I went to school, I was super fortunate that my mum was a teacher, which was beneficial, because she knew how the education system worked, so she knew who she needed to speak to to make sure I got the best opportunity to access the education that I was entitled to. Because again, to, uh, even a generation before me, people with cerebral palsy didn't get the opportunity in, in, in Great Britain to go to mainstream school. They went to a special school, and they were maybe given some color and interdo, and some, like, you might learn to read, but you might not. It was all a bit of potluck, really. But I have had the opportunity to access education. But in that moment, like I said, I hadn't realized until I got older that I was continually using up so much of my energy just trying to be like all my friends trying to do things that they did. Because when people teach you something, they teach it to you in one way. Because, of course, we are all exactly the same. And if it works for one person out of the textbook, then it's going to work for everybody. So generally, what would happen is I would go, Mum, we tried to do this today at school, or we're going to do this at school next week. Because that was what my mum taught me, was always find out what you're going to be doing. Because then you can take control of the situation, and we can practice things, and then you'll, you'll be OK. Because I can do everything that everybody else can do. But I'm pretty certain I don't do any of it the same way that you do it. Because I, only, I have one arm and one leg that works for me, for me. And like sometimes, sometimes I'm like, oh, it'd be cool. To, like I used to race some girls that had two legs and no arms. Or I'd, I'd race people who had no legs and two, and, and two arms. And I'm like, mm, maybe it'd be good to have two of the same thing. Because then you should be balanced. And then like, because there's nothing I do like everybody else. But over time, I've realized that that's OK. And, and when I learned that was at school. Because we got, we were a bit older than three. But essentially, we got the opportunity to learn to play a musical instrument. And so I went home, and I was like, Mum, can I learn to play a musical instrument? And she said, of course you can. What would you like to play? It was a trick question. So I said, oh, I'd really like to play the flute. It makes a really nice noise. And a lot of my other friends are picking the flute. And that, it's cool. I like it. It looks nice. And she said to me, if you really want to play the flute, you can play the flute. And I was like, but? Because there was always a but. But she's like, you're not going to be very good at it. I was like, what? She was like, well, what do you need to play a flute properly and well? And I was like, two functional hands. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, of course, that you do, yes. She said, so you can, if you want, play the flute. I will go and get you a flute. I will buy you the book. I will sign you up for the lessons. I will pay for them. But she said, you're never going to be very good at it. And you're better than that. I was like, fine. So we went that Saturday morning, we went to the local music shop. And we went through every instrument in the store. And I ended up with a cornet. So like a really small brass instrument. But you only needed one hand to play it. And like, I don't know if you can see in this dress. But even though I don't swim anymore, I've still got big, big biceps. <laughs> but I never used to have those as an eight-year-old. So it made sense to pick a small instrument that I could hold by myself, that you only needed one hand to operate, and a good set of lungs, which I'm clearly demonstrating that I've got. So it was all good. And I was like, fine, I'll, set, I'll take the cornet. And on the way home in the car, my mum said to me, like, I was really miserable. And she was like, now look, I know that wasn't your first choice. She said, and so do you, and so does that poor lady in the store that just spent a whole, whole Saturday morning and hired out a corner for one term. But unless you decide to tell anybody else, they will never know that this wasn't your choice. And to everybody else, to the wider world, you are playing a musical instrument. And you, the choice is yours. And that was the moment I realized 
I'm not living with a disability, and I don't have a disability. I am disabled, but I'm disabled by the barriers that society and processes put on me. And from then on, I realized that as long as I was willing to find a way around a barrier or an obstacle or a situation, then ultimately, I could be whatever I wanted and I could succeed in whatever I wanted to do. And it was a really, really liberating feeling. But it wasn't, <laughs> wouldn't it be simple if it, was e if it was all over from then? But it wasn't. And then, so I then, that then led me to a path where I really, I loved sport. I'm like one of the most competitive people on the planet. And I loved all sport and I played all sport. And I ended up being a swimmer, but it wouldn't have been my first choice. But thanks to my wise lessons up to the age of an eight-year-old, I realized that I needed to take control of what I could. So I, swimming was the avenue that presented itself because it was one of the most evolved Paralympic sports at the time. I was, okay, I was good at it. I wasn't brilliant, but I was good. And it pre presented an opportunity. So I decided that I would swim. But as I said, the Paralympics wasn't always what it is now. And my dad said to me, well, that's a great idea, but what are you going to do for a real job? Because swimmers in, 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 in Britain, maybe in America, you get away with being a swimmer. But in, in Britain, swimmers don't earn any money. And Paralympians, they definitely don't earn any money. So what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I like maths and I like money, so I'll be an accountant. And he went, okay, that's fine. He, he took that. He, he was, well, he's an accountant, so he did try to convince me to be a lawyer. But I was like, I don't have time for that. I need to swim. So I stuck with it. I was like, I'll be an accountant. And I, but I, then I said to my mum, you need to go and find me a swimming club. And she's like, oh, well, you're in one. But I was in a swimming club for people with, who, who were disabled. I wasn't in a, a swimming club that trained like an athlete. They were, like I said, they were just glad I didn't drown every time I got in the water. So she, good on her. She did the right mum thing. She went around and looked for a club, found me one, and I went to this club. And then from there... It was fine, it was brilliant, and I just got better and better. But what I had to do in order to go to the Paralympics and keep my dad happy and get a degree was juggle a schedule. And ultimately, that's when I realized that if you, imp if you find a goal that's important to an individual, even if they are working to an overall bigger goal, it might be a collective goal of an organization or a team goal or whatever, but another goal, if you don't make part of that relevant to them and worth it to them, then they are not going to give you their all. Because for me, in order to get that cap and gown and a Paralympic tracksuit, I basically had to set my alarm every morning at 4.37, and I would drive for an hour, and I would swim for two hours, then I would drive back, I'd go to school from 9 till 3.30, then I would get back in the car, I'd drive again, for that an hour, I'd go swimming again, and, and then for two hours, and I'd get back in a car, drive home, and I'd get back into my house at like quarter past nine at night. So essentially, my days, my school days were 17 and a half hours long with zero downtime, because even in my free periods, I used to go to the gym. And the amount of people that say to me, well, I couldn't do that schedule, and there's nothing wrong with me. I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with me. But, but I see their point. Like, it, like life can sometimes be more exhausting for me, but my goal was relevant to me and important to me, and I needed to do it because I wasn't the best swimmer in the world. So if the motivation is there, then the character traits come through. And actually, we are all human beings. And ultimately, what I learned with the whole Cornet situation and what I learned with my daily schedule was es essentially, we're all normal, but everybody's normal is different. And then, so from then, I was like, I made the team, and I got, I got to go to the Paralympics and, in Athens in 2004, and I was 18, and I got a silver medal, and then that meant I had four years to, to go to Beijing, and Beijing was the one where I was like, I'm going to win, because if you say out loud and you commit to it, it's easy, right? So I, again, I made my choices based on the best business schools in the country, the best swimming pools in the country, and the best swimming clubs in the country. And then I crossed them all off until I ended up with what was going to give me the most authentic experience of the whole thing. And I ended up in Swansea University in South Wales. 
And so I didn't have to do any crazy thousand mile commute a week anymore. And in that first year, I broke my first world record. And I was like, wow, I'm the fastest person in the world. That was a good decision. Whew. I was like, I'm on track. And so then fast forward a couple of years. And in my final year, I went to the world championships in South Africa. And I broke the world record again. And I won three gold medals. And it was my most successful championships ever. And I'm never getting back in the water now. So it'll stay that way. <laughs> and then I, I went and I graduated. And the thing that's important about that graduation is, is not, yes, it did what it was supposed to do, but it also broke down so many stereotypes. Because people have genuinely said to me, yeah, but you can't be disabled because you're clever. Or you're, you're really pretty for a, like a disabled person. I'm like, I th thanks, I think. I'm like, OK. But essentially, cognitively, that proved that I am more than capable. And actually, by getting that, that, that cap and gown, and the scroll, obviously, don't forget the scroll, and the, and the gold medals and the world records, it proved that actually I could do whatever I set out to do. If people, I had the right people in my team, I could be the best version of myself. And then so fast forward, I had one whole year into that picture. It's a bit of a spoiler alert, isn't it? The gold medal's right there. But essentially, we got to Beijing, and I won a gold medal. But I'd always dreamt of winning in a world record time and by a body length and a half, so I didn't have to wait for the scoreboard. I knew I'd won. It didn't go down like that at all. I won by half a second, and it was horrific. On the, on the video, it looks like I lost, but I didn't. So, but what was more than that gold medal was, I won that gold medal on the 12th of September, 2008. A long time ago, I know. But on the, on the 1st of September, 2008, I possibly had, I think, what were probably the worst day of my life in as much as, so my mum had been ill for a year, she'd had cancer, and on the 1st of September, when I landed in Beijing, it was the second in China, but it was the first at home, I got a call to say that she'd passed away that night. And so, she had cancer, and it was terminal. I knew at some point she was gonna die, but when I last saw her on August the 23rd, I didn't know it was gonna be the last, I genuinely had no idea it was gonna be the last time I ever saw her. But I had two choices. I could go home, I could stay. Nobody was gonna blame me. And I hadn't actually trained properly for six months because I'd hurt my, I showed you off my bicep, but I hurt my only good limb, my shoulder, and I couldn't do a full stroke of breaststroke from the day I qualified trials to the day we got to China. So everything was stacked up against me. But as I said, you can see from the picture, I got the gold medal. And so that I think, that none of these moments define me but they've given me a platform and an opportunity to show what is possible and to change the perceptions of people who are not normal, in inverted commas. And when we talk, I've been to, I get invited to lots of diversity and inclusion events, to speak at them or to sit on panels or just to be in the audience. And I can assure you, I have never in my life been discriminated against because I'm a female, never. Because people see the fact I'm disabled as a far bigger issue than the fact that I'm a woman. That's ultimately the truth of the matter. And so that kind of led me to like do some more research and then realize that, I, that actually you can create diversity without having inclusion. But if you have authentic inclusion, you will naturally have diversity. So if you target a specific, and we do it, and we've all got to start somewhere, right? Like, so this is not in by any shape or form a criticism, but it's an observation. If you choose a specific area to target or a demographic to target, and we've all, like I said, we've all got to start somewhere, yes, you're increasing diversity, and yes, you are being more inclusive, but you are not being fully inclusive. Inclusion means everybody, an opportunity. And so, we'll go on to that side. And this is what led me to set up the ability people. Because ultimately, I'm one of the lucky ones. I've been able to be the best version of myself, ultimately because I've always been in situations, whether it be as an athlete or in a career post-swimming, post I became a broadcaster. So I still got to pick and choose my work. And I, I'm an athlete mentor, so I work with young people. But again, I get to choose my work. I get to choose my hours and I get to choose my rest periods. So I, I'm in control of my optimum function. 
But not everyone's got that luxury. And in the UK, I heard a stat that the employment gap for disabled people was, it's lower than in America, so that's the American stat, 46.8%. I'll get to that in a minute. But ultimately, it was 30%. But it wasn't, the 30% did bother me, but the thing that bothered me more was the fact that it hadn't moved in 10 years. And I'm like, how can that be possible? Like, we're living in the 21st century here. Like, we've all got more equipment that makes us more independent. We've all got more access to things. Why is it? What are the issues? And I started to look into them. And what an employment gap means is the difference between the people who are in employment who ha are disabled and those that are in employment that are not disabled. So in the US of A, it is 46.8%, which is enormous. So people who are disabled, are the percentage of people in employment in the U USA, anybody want to hazard a guess? No? OK, I'll put you out of your misery. Is 19.1% of people who are disabled in this country are in employment. And the, the number or the percentage for those who are in employment who are not disabled, anyone want to have a go? OK, I'll put you out of your misery. You can do the math. But it's 65.9%. Like, that gap is enormous, and there's no reason for it other than lack of understanding, lack of exposure, lack of realization of potential opportunity on one hand, but also capability on the other hand. And so when we talk about the employment gap and we talk about why it's there, like I said, I wanted to explore it. And there are a number of reasons, but ultimately, it does, a lot of it comes down to that level of unconscious bias that we are all, we all have. We've all got it. And the thing is, it's unconscious. So it's not intentional. So we should never be embarrassed that we have it or we haven't realized. But what we should do is we have a duty to become more aware of what impacts that unconscious bias and what affects it and how we can open our minds to check ourselves when it is happening. And also, I think sometimes that's the problem. We realize that people don't know where to start. And so when you, and often when you're trying to do the right thing, you end up doing the wrong thing because you are doing it. There's never, ever any malice when somebody tries to help a person who is not like them. Like, we're not in high school anymore, so people aren't intentionally mean. But without the right support and the right education, and the right advice, and the right people being consulted, then how can we possibly know what everybody needs? So that was kind of where we went then. And then we went further into it, and one in four people in, dis in this country are disabled. In the UK, it's one in five. But it's still a high, it's still a high number. And so I'm, I ask you, if you were to turn now into this room, if this room represented the country we're in at the moment, that means one in every four of you is disabled in some way. And disabilities come in all shapes and sizes, all different things. But like, if you looked around this room now, is there a quarter of this room that you would tell weren't good enough for the job they're doing? Or that you would question whether, you, whether they thought they could do it? No, exactly. Everybody here has got their job and is here. But the law of averages and the stats say, regardless of whether people have disclosed or not, if they are disabled, they must be people in this room that are. And they've got those jobs. And they are capable. So why is it that we then don't afford the opportunity of choice to everybody? And I think the thing that bothers me most is that I know amazing people with who are disabled, who aren't disabled. I just know amazingly productive people. And I know that it can, like I said, it can, it can sometimes stifle talent. The process can get in the way. There are so many different things that you can do, and now the clicker's not working, that can make a difference. And in 2018, that's when we launched the Ability People. And we waited, and we got it, we waited until we were ready. And what we did was we looked at who we wanted in our team and what we wanted to do. And ultimately, we wanted to reduce the employment gap 
for disabled people around the world. So we have consultants based, we have some in America, we have them all over the world, and we work with companies all over the world because ge geography is not a barrier for us. And it shouldn't be a barrier for anyone. So what we did was we looked at how we, who we needed in that team, and we looked at what prevented them from currently working or working in a job that they wanted, and we got rid of the barriers. So everybody works remotely, and they work whatever hours they can commit to. And they work when they function best. So we have members of our team that don't start till after lunch. We have members of our team that work through the night because they're not awake in the day. We have members of the team that work solid 24 hours and then don't, you don't see them for three days. Like, but as a team, we succeed because we are all in it, back to a point I made earlier, we are all in it for the greater good of, 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 of the world, but also of ourselves. Because ultimately, you want to be able to live, not just work. Why should a person who's different, and that's not just someone who's disabled, that's anybody, why should they not have the opportunity to live a life as well as prove that they're good at their job? Whether you're a parent, whether you have got an hour and a half commute to work, whatever it is, why, why can't we remove those barriers and trust the people? So that's what we did. We set up the ability people, and we then went through helping other organizations understand disability and understand that it's not, it doesn't make you weaker. And that when, like people who are disabled, they're not a charity case. They don't need your, your pity. They just need your understanding to give them a fair opportunity. And, fair, and that's when we get to equality versus equity. And the fact that treating someone equally is not an equitable experience for them. So if you treat someone equally, that means they all get treated the same. But actually, by treating everybody the same, you stifle their talent, you limit their potential, and you suppress what they could be bringing to your organization. If you give them a, everything that they need to perform at the best, that's an equitable experience. That means that's equity. That's what we're going for. That's inclusion. So that's where we want to go. So we've worked with organizations on various different things. And like people, like I said, people never have the intent of trying to make your life difficult. They always attempt to make a change in a positive way, but by not consulting the right people, they just waste resources, they waste money. And if they get it really wrong, they actually antagonize the community because they're like, oh, why don't you just ask me? Because again, it's like, it's that implant, imp you're implying that you still know better than I know about how I, ooh, sorry, about how I function. But actually, why wouldn't you just ask the person what they need? Because often your perception of what I need is nowhere near the reality, and it would be a lot cheaper if you just ask me. So we've worked with organizations just at the front end, at the very front end of their process, because so many people so often are focused on how they can make the experience for a disabled person better, but what they don't realize is the disabled person's never gonna get there because they can't get in the door at the initial part of the process. Whether that be your online application, or whether that be your interview style, whatever it is, sometimes you're, you're trying to fix a problem that's never gonna occur because it's never gonna have the chance to occur. And then we've worked with other organizations on a deeper level, and one of them is HSBC, and we work with them on their, um, their graduate program scheme for their technology department. And every step of the way, they would consult us. We, we, found them, we found them candidates, but also what we did was we helped them with every stage, every part of the process, what was, why it might not be the beneficial for that, for that candidate to go through that process. And then once we got candidates through the process, we worked with the entire intake on a, se on a session around empathy and understanding. And then what we found was more people disclosed the fact that they were disabled in some way. Because, as, as you saw, the stats in the UK, one in five are disabled. In America, it's one in four. But in, America, in the UK, even though 20% of people are disabled in some way, own, most organizations only have a one, one or two percent disclosure rate. And then what does that mean? That means that these people are not being able to function at their, their level or their optimum level because they're exhausted from trying to fit in or trying to cover up their difference because 
Nobody ever judges someone who wears glasses, right? Like, you never have to explain why you've got glasses on. It's just assumed. I mean, sometimes it's for fashion. But ultimately, you never have to assume that you, why you're wearing glasses. But ultimately, that should be the same for anybody. We should create an environment where it's accessible to all. And if you, it's accessible in every sense, and that's not putting an elevator in or a ramp or a railing on the stairs, which would be really useful, just saying. But, um, but any, not just physical, but in the way that people are spoken to. Because as I said for my first little toddler picture, not everybody's disabilities or impairments are obvious or visible. And actually, sometimes they're the ones that really struggle to fit in. So at TAP, or in the world, and actually for everybody in this room, and hopefully everyone at this conference, we've got that one goal, and it's parity of opportunity, to a point where people have fairness in a process or in life. And like, we all say life is unfair, and there's always going to be situations where people are disadvantaged. And that is like survival of the fittest, that's, comp that's competition, that's why we don't all do the same job, or we aren't all the same personality. But ultimately, what we need to get to is a point where everybody has the chance, and everybody has the opportunity, because who, we, we're, not li we're living in a world where fairness should be everywhere. Society is diverse. Society, you would hope, is inclusive to some level. But ultimately, the biggest thing is, if we don't have an organization that represents society, then how can we serve it best? How can people thrive? And if we were all the same, then we would never get anywhere. Like if I tried to swim by myself, I would never have won without my doctor, without my physio, without my nutritionist, without my coach, because I didn't have that knowledge. Oh, and I, I acquired it, but I never acquired the amount that they had. So I had the most elite team around me at any one time to make sure that I could be the best athlete in the world. So why does it not make sense that we make our teams as strong as they can be? And we access talent that at the moment we're not going to ever access because people get to a point where they, I'm not going to explain myself to you or why I do things differently. And I'm not going to beg you to change a process for me. If, you're, if, you, if I have to do all of those things, then you're not the organization for me. That's how people think. Because why should I? Like, why sh like, back to the glasses thing, you don't have to explain why you're wearing glasses or apologize for wearing glasses. You just wear the glasses. So why should any other need be any different? So my question to you. So what is it that we are going to do to change this? Who's, who is going to change this? And ultimately, it's us. Every individual on the planet can make a change. And we can change ourselves, and we can change the world a day at a time. But ultimately, to go back to being an athlete, we lived in this world where we had three zones, comfort, stretch, and panic. And I, that isn't, it's, not, it's not reserved for the world of sport. It's, it's everybody lives in those zones at various stages of their lives. I mean, as British people, when we keep going to these talks with Americans and they say, get up and dance, that, that, that's so far into our panic zone <laughs> that like, we're not playing, OK? But ultimately, the development happens in the stretch zone, where you go out of your comfort zone and you make a difference, because change only happens then. And you change yourself. You change your organization. You change your talent pool, and you change how attractive your organization and your team becomes to talent. Because that's when you end up with the strongest team. And we go from a world where we're trying to fit in and trying to be like everybody else and trying not to be judged. Like how many people thought about their outfits when they were packing to come here? All those different things. But ultimately, being different, when you're a kid, when you're young, you see it as a weakness. But it's the biggest strength you can have. It's such a competitive advantage to not think like anybody else. Because if we all thought the same, we would never solve the problems. And so when I say, what will you do? Hopefully, this has been a bit thought provoking and you'll go away and you'll think. But hopefully also, you'll go back and live by, I'm going to give you three E's to, live, to, to, to approach this with. And it's exposure, education, and empathy. Those three things get you far. 
You can't be blamed for knowing something that you've never needed to know or you've never been exposed to. So like back to the graduation picture, and the reason it was so funny is because when I went to that swim team and I joined, my coach left me in the lane with 10-year-olds until I was 15 because he was judging me solely based on time. And I can't go as fast as everybody who's got two fancy arms and two fancy legs that work. Like, I can't do it. So I didn't move, and it goes back to that equality versus equity. I was in equal, I was allowed in the pool, but I wasn't getting a quittable um, experience out of the process. But not only that, he tried to tell me how to add up and, make, and, and work out the averages of a, heart, a test set that we were doing, because he thought, because I was disabled, I wasn't educated. Because in his, in his era, like I said, I wouldn't have been educated. So you can only go on your experiences, but you owe it to yourself and you owe it to your organization and you owe it to people around you to become more aware and become more educated and do learn to empathize with difference because everybody's normal is different, but it doesn't make anybody's better or worse than anybody else's. And you should never need to be in a position where you have to justify why you do something the way you do it. But you want an organ, a society and a community where you feel like you can. So like for me, for example, if some days it'll take, I brush my hair today and everything, but sometimes it'll take like 40, 40 minutes to do my hair because I just can't get my hand to do what I want it to do. Or I'll ask my partner to do it and he'll do it wrong. And I'm like, no, it's wrong, do it again. But, but ultimately, sometimes I'll do it in 10 seconds. But if I came in to the desk and sat down and I went, oh my God, I'm so exhausted because I couldn't even put my hair up this morning, people are like, what is wrong with you? But I don't have children, but if I did and I came into the office all in a fluster, I said, oh my gosh, we were just about to leave the house this morning, the cereal went all over the floor, I had to change the kids, I had to, and then I got stuck in traffic and then I was late for that. People would understand that because it's normal. And the point is we want to get to a world where we can be our whole selves, we, can, we don't have to judge. And we, can, and we can do that in a variety of different ways. And it's, about, it's not about trying to prove that you are willing and able, but you don't know where to look. It's about seeking out the right people. And whether that's through sessions where you, where, you, where you expose yourself to being disabled for an hour. And we do a lot of that at the ability people, where we, we do simulation, we do team building, but we expose people to difference. We, impl we impose a difference on you, just so you understand a different way of thinking whether you meet people who are disabled, because some people have never met people who, or who they know to be disabled before. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it, and there's a lot of ways to help, see if we could help you. But, but ultimately, the idea is that if you get that education, you get that exposure, and you have that empathy, then there's no reason why we end up not treating everyone like human beings, because I was just a little girl that wanted to be the best in the world at something. And I had, it ended up, I had my gold medal dream, I'm going to put the clicker down, of being a swimmer and being the best swimmer in the world. And luckily for you guys, here's my gold medal. Whoop. So just, just because my gold medal was a piece of metal on a piece of rope, ribbon, rope, whatever, and, every, and people can relate to that, it does not mean that other people shouldn't be afforded the same opportunity because we've, every single one of us on the planet has our own version of a gold medal dream. And we have a duty, duty to each other as humans to empower people and give them the opportunity to succeed. So thank you very much. <laughs>